This is why it's a classic. A defense of the film canon. A tribute to the pantheon of great immortal movies. Here you'll find why a classic screenplay is exemplary and universal. Why a classic's visual style is a perfect display of craft, creativity and beauty. Why the story and the image you can see right there on screen are the absolute epitome of eternal excellence. And today we'll go through the classic of all classics. The immensely beloved American masterpiece, Casablanca. Nori wants us to finish this bottle and then three more. Says he'll water his garden with champagne before he let the Germans drink it. <laughs> this sort of takes the sting out of being occupied. You said it. He's looking at you, kid. First I'll go through the movie's perfect script, then through its perfect direction. But since this is the most widely studied screenplay ever written, and I dislike saying information you might find elsewhere, the script bit will be brief. 20,000 francs says it isn't. It's 1941, World War II, in a refugee-jammed Moroccan city whose name I don't remember. Humphrey Bogart plays Rick, a cynical nightclub owner who tries to remain neutral while interacting with immigrants, criminals, Nazis, customers, workers and the lovely degenerate corrupt chief of police, Louis Renault. Things get dicey when Victor Laszlo, resistance fighter extraordinaire, arrives with Ilsa, Rick's former girlfriend, who broke his heart. It doesn't feel that complicated when you're watching it. I don't know what's right any longer. It's one of the reasons why this film continues to endure. It's got everything. Romance, mystery, thrills, comedy, adventure, musical interludes and an exotic location. This crowded plot moves so incessantly and briskly you don't even care about all those plot holes. Let's be honest. Why don't the Germans simply arrest Laszlo, who keeps flashing his real name around like he's James Bond, and be done with it? Who's gonna complain, Renault? Any violation of neutrality would reflect on Captain Renault. Don't buy it. And who's checking those heavenly letters of transit? Signed by General Vigon. The gold signature wouldn't be worth the paper it's written on for the Nazis. Can we start a petition to have Ryan George pitch Casablanca? Cannot be rescinded. Not even questioned. So the movie can happen. Just goes to show how unimportant is a flawless plot when characters and dialogue are flawless themselves. Apparently you're the only one in Casablanca who has even less scruples than I. Casablanca is mostly remembered as a love story, but you can take that part as just another subplot. This is a tapestry of lively characters brought together by Rick's Cafe the richest, most boisterous location in the history of cinema. Even the nameless guitar lady has a personality. Take the 48 script pages that make up the sequence that introduces the place. In 30 nimble minutes we map out the whole building. The bar, the casino, Rick's hovering office and the exterior which we even find out is in front of the airport. And all characters and plot threads are introduced in quick succession. Ugarte's stolen letters of transit, which Rick hides in the piano, Yvonne's romantic disappointment with Rick, Emil handling the casino, Strasser's influence over Renault, Renault's horniness, Ferrari wanting to buy the cafe, and the whole Laszlo Lund intrigue, of course. Only the Bulgarian couple subplot emerges at a later time, and it illustrates how talented classical screenwriters had to be to work under the Hays Code. Everything's implied, never stated. I'm not saying we should bring back censorship, but writers could try to be discreet again. Nobody ever loved me that much. Like how the adorably shameless chief of police sexually exploits desperate women. Another visa problem has come up. Show her in. And it's just a recurring joke? But I'll be in tomorrow night with a breathtaking blonde. And it'll make me very happy if she loses. Man... The script has enough broad humor to make it pleasing for every type of person in any era. Everywhere. This place is full of vultures, vultures everywhere. Mind these jokes that use immediate irony. In Casablanca, I am master of my fate. I am Major Captain... Major Strasser is here, sir. Are uh, you saying? Excuse me. Something is spoken. The Reichstag and I are speaking nothing but English now. Then its opposite happens immediately. Liebchen, the sweetness at. What watch? Ten watts. Such much? It's simple, but it never fails to get a chuckle. I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. You're winning, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Everybody out at once. Let's talk about Rick. It's widely known he has the best character arc of all time. But what makes it so successful is that he doesn't really change as a person. He simply holds true to his real self and stops pretending he doesn't care. The script makes you ready for this fact by having both Renault and Laszlo hint at it. Because, my dear Ricky, I suspect that under that cynical shell, you're at heart a sentimentalist. You know how you sound, Mr. Blaine? 
Like a man who's trying to convince himself of something he doesn't believe in his heart. And we witness Rick adapting his behavior so slowly that by the time the ending comes, the arc seemed inevitable. When we meet Rick, he doesn't drink with customers. He takes no sides. He doesn't like people winning at his casino. Too much at least. And he'll stick his neck out for nobody. I stick my neck out for nobody. In the same sequence, he's already drinking with customers. A precedent is being broken. Later on, he stops a fight between a German and a Frenchman. Understandable for now. He lets the Bulgarian win big at roulette, he allows Laszlo to play La Marseillaise, he risks his life for Laszlo and Ilsa, and he kills Strasser. A gradual escalation. Another president gone. This has been a very interesting evening. Let's give credit to the Epstein brothers for their deliciously wisecracking dialogue. Mm, my eyes really brown. The story could have easily delved into mush if its use of words hadn't been so clever. You despise me, don't you? Well, if I gave you any thought, I probably would. And Rick lights up every scene by always saying the least expected answer to every question. Who were you last night? That's so long ago, I don't remember. What is your nationality? I'm a drunkard. Will I see you tonight? I never make plans that far ahead. Do you ever notice how Yvonne's arc is like a miniature version of Rick's? Think about it. She starts off broken-hearted, then she collaborates with the enemy, or at best becomes indifferent. Then finally she turns patriotic. Or am I reading too much into it? Let's skip to the film's direction now. I talked about how Rick's cafe is a busy and bustling location. The writers managed to cram as much drama and activity as they could into the place. Perhaps if you told him I ran the second largest banking house in Amsterdam. Second largest? That wouldn't impress Rick. The leading banker in Amsterdam is now the best chef in our kitchen. But it's director Michael Curtiz who conducts it to make it geographically clear. You always know where every part of the place is located and visually interesting. There's always something to look at. The camera sometimes leaves a character to search for someone else. Waiting, waiting, waiting. But most of the time it moves by following someone's movement, leading us directly to another character. It's a way of connecting everyone visually and seamlessly. La Tunisie, Nice, we see two immigrants talking, then the middle ground waiter leaves to the left and we follow him, catching snippets of more conversation. The waiter leaves to the left, but we stay with the cheery Russian bartender. As the camera follows Carl here, we are unwittingly mapping out the casino and meeting new characters. Here the camera follows Renault to Carl, then he goes to the left to instruct a guard, who inherits the camera and brings it back to another guard. Then the camera follows no one, because it's waiting for Rick. Stephen approves. Curtis was one of the greatest champions of movement, joining the choreography of where he moves his actors with just a seamless choreography of moving camera and the way he would crane or dolly almost like a dance while the characters were also moving like a dance. It's a master class of how to move characters in camera. Curtis gives Casablanca a constant pace by frequently beginning shots with movement. Instead of cutting to a static shot of a table and having a character walk to it, he'll cut to the character who's in motion and follow him to the table, even if we only catch the walk for a second. I believe this technique tricks the audience into never thinking, here's another dialogue exchange. Instead, they always think, oh, a new dynamic scene is beginning. One character is always leading the camera to another character. This story doesn't stop. This world doesn't stop. It's a galaxy revolving. And the camera doesn't only follow players around, it highlights drama. Notice how this famous moment is shot. Two shot of our couple, Rick speaks to Louis off screen, cut to Louis. Now, instead of simply cutting back to the couple, Curtis cuts to all three characters and closes in on the couple. I'm saying it because it's true. Visually excluding Renault. He does it all the time. We start a shot with everything, these people in this place. Then once the story gets moving, we close in on the players that really matter. This character here, Colonel Heinz, he does nothing in the film besides being excluded. Bye. Bye. This pushing is often masked by some sort of movement. Sometimes it's the third wheel leaving the frame. Sometimes it's an important player entering the frame. Movements that help hide the camera movement. Here Rick stands up and walks to the background, the camera following slightly. As he returns, Laszlo stands up and the camera closes in on them. Camera motion hidden by blocking. Invisible directing. 
Unlike modern cinema's obsession with needless push-in close-ups which accomplish nothing, Casablanca's push-ins are used on two shots to start exchanges by excluding what's not in the conversation, or on a few singles to show reactions. In this case, it's mostly with Ilsa, which I have to attribute to Ingrid Bergman's face being a camera magnet. Besides moving his players and his camera, Curtiz also makes Casablanca visually distinct by filling up the frame as much and as harmoniously as possible. Curtiz and his DP Arthur Edison use smoke, shadow and light to create an atmosphere that most films should envy. Shots are full, dynamically composed and inviting to the eye. Even ceiling fans also add a sense of location and some extra motion. Let's also give credit to art director Carl Jules Weil. Mind how much Rick's Cafe gains from cigarette smoke. Think of how pointless is that airport searchlight in front of Rick's. Perfect for visual drama, though. See Ilsa's grand entrance after the flashback. We begin this shot with typical movement following Sam to the right, leaving the dark background door in the middle, in expectation. As Ilsa enters, the searchlight makes her shine. Speaking of light, did you ever notice Rick hiding the letters in Sam's piano? The spotlight shines on him in the middle. He waits till it goes away and immediately hides his MacGuffins now that he's in darkness. The spotlight returns to the piano just as he walks away. And shadows are as useful as light. When we first enter Rick's office, the camera follows our characters and goes through a wall. We don't need to directly see Rick opening the vault, because Curtis casts a convenient shadow into the frame. When Renault meets Laszlo, he's first foreshadowed by his shadow. And when Rick is in Renault's office, mind the fence shadow spinning, Renault rings his guard to open the door. An action we don't need to see directly, because shadows tell us everything. With clever compositions, Curtis can show the most by using the least. We don't need to see this bartender Ilsa talks to. His foreground arm is more than enough. Even when they use scope, most directors can't show as much information as Curtis. Mind this walk and talk of Rick and Louis. They stop as Rick brings up the MacGuffins. Have the letters right here. Rick mentions the piano and it just so happens the camera stopped precisely when it was in the foreground. This foreground bit that was reached so casually could have been nothing but some texture for the shot. But Curtis makes sure it's the exact piano they talk about and point out. Says me right for not being musical. Which goes to show how the staging in Casablanca is also worth learning from. Check this brief scene featuring Renault and Strasse. Instead of beginning with both characters sitting down, Curtis has Renault stamp random papers in the background, while Strasser smokes closer to the camera. Renault brings some papers to the front, moves from right to left and sits down. Never forget shadows and smoke. In Rick's office, before he sits down to talk to Renault, he moves from the foreground to open the background window. Louis crosses over from left to right. Rick returns to the middle and sits on the table as Louis sits on the sofa. Characters don't only talk, they visibly do things and interact with the world they're in. And they perform the cross, which never hurts. In his scene with Yvonne, Rick goes to the middle of the frame and interacts with Sasha on the right, consciously ignoring Yvonne to the left. She asks for a drink, which Rick denies. And Sasha moves from the right to the middle. Rick orders him out so he leaves the frame to the right while Rick moves from the right to the left. This is non-stop visual variety. Don't forget the shadow and light and the smoke. Cinema really lost something when smoking fell out of fashion. Visually, I mean. Basically, Casablanca has a strong, ever-moving visual style to match its strong, ever-moving screenplay. It is never boring for one second either in word or in frame. And I didn't even go over the great performances. Paul Henry aside. Just like I said about The Searchers, this movie is alive. It's more than a story, it's a universe. Just a lucky guy. Casablanca is the best of everything Hollywood could once upon a time do, and everything popular movies should still strive to accomplish. Viewer, if you like and subscribe, this will be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Also consider joining my Patreon and tell me in the comments which classic you'd like to see covered next. Just remember, classics ended after the 60s. Thank you for watching.